You know the old adage about politics, you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose? Introducing Argentina's Javier Millet, and even though the winner of Sunday's presidential runoff didn't wield a chainsaw like he did on the campaign trail, this free market absolutist did again promise in his acceptance speech, well, Argentina's answer to draining the swamp. How radical will he be? How bad off is the country this time? Argentina, once again, finding itself in the throes of hyperinflation and a crippling debt crisis that's wiped out savings. Will government services be gutted in the name of reform? What's the alternative? Now, mind you, he's got no path to a majority in parliament. Will Millet turn to conspiracy theories and culture wars, the ones he peddled on the campaign trail? More broadly, with the likes of Donald Trump and Jair Bolsonaro and even Elon Musk rushing to congratulate Millet, what does this South American election uh, say about what politics will look like in 2024? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking how radical a turn it is for Argentina. Joining us from Buenos Aires, a one-time junior minister for trade, Carlos Vinograd, professor uh, at the Paris School of Economics. Thanks for being with us. Hello, Francois. Uh, very happy to be with you. Also in the Argentine capital, economist Ignacio Tesson. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to meet you, Francois. Former Buenos Aires correspondent David Agormazano cracks the whip at France24.com. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Good evening, Francois. The uh, France24 debate, where you could join the conversation you have on the hashtag F24Debate. Peronist economy minister, uh, the uh, Peronist economy minister was in the lead uh, after the first round, proving polls wrong uh, when uh, Mr. Massa finished tops in last month's first round. This time, there was no surprise. It wasn't even close. Javier Millet winning nearly 56% of the vote. Suddenly, he's no longer a novelty item. Jenny Shin has more. Surrounded by supporters and revving a chainsaw to symbolically cut government spending, this is Javier Millet, the far-right populist who won a resounding victory on Sunday to become Argentina's president-elect. This is a historic night, not because of us, but because one way of doing politics has ended and another begins. Today we turn the page on our history and we return to the path we should never have lost. An economist by training, the 53-year-old lawmaker is against minimum wage, against abortion and plans to dollarize the economy. Millet describes himself as an anarcho-capitalist by mixing ultra-liberal and conservative values. Nicknamed El Loco, meaning the madman, he's been likened to Donald Trump and Jair Bolsonaro for his stand against global socialism. And after years of inflation and Peronist policies, his anti-establishment talk has rallied supporters to his cause. Argentina is going to be a land of opportunities, a land for those who work, get up early and want to do things better. With radical changes ahead, Millet wants to eliminate the central bank as well as key ministries and end all social programs. He's convinced he can reverse the country's traditionally leftist policies and bring back a liberal agenda in Argentina. Before we talk about the latest, uh, Ignacio Tesson, you, you voted for Javier Millet. Tell us why. Well, not only I voted for Javier, I also spoke a lot uh, on social media about him. And, and I've been analyzing the, this movement uh, since, I guess, 2016 or 2017, when uh, he began appearing on television. Um, and, and the question, why are people voting for Millet? Why, why did people elect Millet? It's very simple. Uh, you have a society divided in two. Uh, uh, historically, we would talk about Peronism and anti-Peronism, but that, that dichotomy, that, that, uh, that binary option was sorted out thanks to Millet. Um, this is the end of a, a concept that was coined not so long ago, which, which is the Grieta. And uh, what we have, have now is uh, a person, an, an economist, that 
Most people believe that we'll solve economic problems. I wouldn't say that Millet has been elected for his uh, conservative views, for example. Uh, why do you think, Carlos Vinograd, that uh, he won so handily? Well, I think that um, that um, Ignacio pointed to uh, to to some central points, and and I would say, as Carlisle and the the advisor to 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 Clinton in the in the re-election, say it's the economy, it's stupid. A lot will be played with the economy. Argentina is a country uh, that was the uh, at the top in uh, of Latin America and. And true, uh, in terms of education, in terms of the size of its middle classes, and has been it has been trapped in a in a long and secular uh, stagnation uh, and and I would say decadence. And so there is a tremendous frustration. Argentina today converges to Latin American, the Latin American average, but. With a big difference with the other Latin Americans, it converges from upwards and not from downwards. Uh, the progress in Chile, in Peru, in Brazil, where the 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 growth of and the and the and the birth of uh, big middle classes in the last 30 years, Argentina has been losing this. Argentina had. In 1970s. Uh, okay, but uh, but but Carlos, let me ask you: Why did they, in that case, opt for this radical voice? Wants to eliminate the central bank. Uh, the opposition couldn't the opposition have just been, you know, a traditional conservative? Yeah, I I think that uh, there is a there is a couple of elements. People want to change in the economy, but uh, the the last 20 years and the the compact of uh, of a populist left uh, dominating the 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 scene, the political scene, is you know incumbent and alternatives. The alternative, there was a center government uh, before this last uh, period of Kirchner governments, and there there is something to be discussed, which is the difference between the Kirchner, Kirchner version of Peronism and Peronism, which is a magma. And I think that uh, there is a fury in the population and and with a, a rock star anti-system style, Millet managed to appeal to 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 the fury of the people. He he managed to get to the popular sectors and compete with the traditional uh, Peronist base. But uh, the economy will be the driver. Why him? Actually, the centrist, the more rational centrist conventional group uh, had a third of the vote. The whole thing shifted from a bipartisan system to a tripartisan system. So it's not that the center was destroyed. Actually, the shift of the center produced this massive landslide. If you just do the arithmetics, Patricia Bullrich from the, uh, um, the, 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 the center reformist party had 25% of the vote and Millet had 30 in the first round and Millet had 56 in the second round. So what Millet has a landslide, but almost half of his vote is a centrist vote that finds part of the platform extravagant on certain issues, but mm. is so much tired of the populist uh, incumbents that is going for him. But Millet has to take into account that. But let, me, let, me, let, me bring in, let me bring in David Gormazano on this, because uh, here in France, uh, we have a two-round system for presidential elections, and uh, when it comes time for the second round, at least it's been the case uh, of late, uh, you have a, a, a more radical candidate, and uh, uh, centrists uh, have, uh, if they don't like the uh, Emmanuel Macron, they still held their nose and voted for him in the second round. In Argentina, the centrists that said, we'll go with the radical against the incumbent. Yes, that's what happened. Um, Javier Milei did this extraordinary thing, is that 
in the first round, he did beat uh, the, 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 the right wing, the classical right wing, with Patricia Bullrich and, uh, and the ex-president uh, Mauricio Macri, who, was, who mildly uh, supported her. And in the second round, he did beat the Peronist candidates. Uh, so what, what it says is that Argentina has been very heavily divided in the last 20 years in between uh, K and anti-K, K being Kirchner, uh, Nestor, and then Cristina Kirchner, and then Alberto Fernandez, the, 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 the incumbent president, and their opponents, the anti-K. And what, what, what has happened in this uh, election is that the economic crisis has fueled the candidacy of Javier Milei. And in the end, in the moment of choosing between Javier Milei and the current uh, Minister of the e Economy, people went for the anti peronist vote massively. There was no frontier, no, no boundary saying, no, we can't go there because it's dangerous. So Argentina has seen a populist win before. In 1989, uh, Peronist Carlos Menem became the second elected president after the return to uh, democracy. David Gormizano, um, is this that kind of a thing? Uh, or is this really, are we really in uncharted territories? I guess the question I'm asking. We are, we are very much in, uh, in uncharted territory because Javier Milei is totally it was in two three years ago he was practically unknown he was and then and then he became uh, a, a popular uh, guest on on TV shows and then he became an MP for Buenos Aires and then he started his campaign at the beginning of of this year uh, using social media very much uh, with the with a team around him but that has no record in uh, Argentine politics. And that's new because Carlos Menem was promised a lot. And he'd been a governor before, he, he knew. Yes. And, and, and he, he, he was a product of the Peronist electoral machine to, to win elections. Uh, Milei comes, apparently comes out from the blue. And that's, that's the first time in, in, in recent Argentine uh, political uh, history. He, Ignacio Tesson, he's got, what, less than 10% uh, of the lawmakers in both chambers uh, of parliament. Um, who's he going to reach out to? Well, first, uh, we must say that the, the traditional opposition here, which is or was um, Junto por el Cambio, uh, it's, broken. it's basically broken. There were uh, three parties inside of this coalition, and now it's broken. Um, you have, on, on one hand, the Unión Cívica Radical and the, and the Coalición Cívica, and you also have Propuesta Republicana, which is the party of uh, former President Mauricio Macri. And even uh, the party of Mauricio Macri is divided in, in terms of what they think or how much they support Millet. So the first people that uh, will help Millet is one wing, only one wing of the uh, this political party, which is Propuesta Republicana, and and the deputies that will or might help Millet pass uh, legislation will be uh, these uh, these deputies that, that uh, are part of the. Uh, of the Macri Bullrich wing of the of the Propuesta Republicana Party. Uh, unfortunately, we, we must say that uh, Millet will have to turn or will need to use um, certain tools that democracy provides him, like uh, decretos de necesidad y urgencia, which are basically uh, decrees. The president can uh, constitutionally used to to impose in certain ways because you have uh so, all right so let's give course. a concrete example yeah. then ignacio uh, do you believe like him that uh, uh argentina should just close down the central bank and if so do you do it by decree 
you, well, you cannot do it by decree because there's a there's a uh, uh, there's a constitutional mandate of the central bank to exist. So this Carta Organica is, is that's the name of of, of this uh, constitutional mandate. Uh, you just you cannot just um, you know, erase it. You can't delete it. You can't press delete on a computer and, and then you, you close the central bank. I would say that the dollarization will take, uh, based on, 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 the, on the economics, uh, on the, based on, on my economic contacts, I would say that they will try to reach out. They will try to uh, reach dollarization in one or two years. Yeah, that's what uh, that's what was said uh, uh, in his first radio interview uh, since Malay uh, won. Uh, that's what he said. It's going to take a little longer uh, than you think. It's going to take uh, two years to tame uh, inflation. He he added. So I, I, I guess the beginning of reality. Argentina, which is staring at a debt crisis, one hundred and forty percent inflation, uh, according to the IMF. That's third worst on the planet right now. Uh, more than two in five Argentinian citizens now living below the poverty line. The latest economic policies have led us to this situation. Today, more than half the population has voted for a different option. And I hope that things will change a lot. I'm part of Javier's party and I wish him all the best. I hope that things will change and that we won't have the economic instability that we have now. It's a very big change, God willing, for all Argentinians. Enough corruption, enough insecurity, enough inflation, enough poor people. We were very tired, we wanted to renew, we wanted to see new faces. Always the same ones. I bet on change, on Malay, that it will go well for him, it will go well for the country. Carlos Vinegrad, that woman wearing the national football strip, kind of like what we saw, I guess, in Brazil where supporters of Jair Bolsonaro uh, often wore Brazil's uh, national colors at rallies. Uh, is, is our, what would you say to those supporters of, uh, of uh, Javier Millet when it comes to their expectations? Well, I think that you're touching a central point. Uh, when you quote uh, the, 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 the inflation rate, actually, the annual inflation rate at the last three months rate, which is 12% per month, it's not 140%, it's 300%. If you annualize the last three months, the inflation rate is double than the accumulated rate of this year. How, how, so, come, we're, how come we're always back to this scenario in, in Argentina? It's not the first time. Why is it that we suddenly have these periods of hyperinflation all the time? Well, I, I, I have a bad news for you. It's, it's not still hyperinflation, but uh, the situation is very fragile and it could explode in hyperinflation, which, which is still a higher level of inflation where prices rise at, uh, at a much higher rate, like uh, uh, in, in the German hyperinflation of 23 or in the Argentine inflations of 89 and 90, inflation rises at 5-10% uh, per day. This is a hyperinflation. So still we are not there, but we could go there. But that's a technical, a technical discussion. The issue is that uh, what's the complexity of getting a stabilized economy? You ask why Argentina is back and forth in this situation is, and I remember a conference with a, 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 an advisor to, to Angela Merkel, and I said that how, how Germans are still traumatized by the hyperinflation of 23 and they are so conservative on money. And he said to me, ah, maybe I should ask you the reverse question. How are Argentines not traumatized by consistent and permanent uh, high inflation? And it's true. It's a, it's a, Argentina is an economic and social enigma. I, I will not try to answer why this is. But the challenge is to tame inflation, and it's going to be very complicated. And that's a fracture and a strong demand from population beyond all the extravagant. And, and the solution of dollarization, of replacing the peso by the U.S. dollar, is that a good idea? Uh, François, this is a very uh, uh, um, uh, a dense uh, discussion, which is... Uh, 
I would try to resume it as such. First, uh, there are the cost and the advantages of losing a national money, but Argentina doesn't have a national money today because the peso is destroyed. So the dollarizers have an argument, which is if you conquer uh, stabilization is one thing, but today we don't have a currency and all the benefits to have an autonomous currency. However, dollarization will tie and eliminate any capacity in the future to arbitrate any external or domestic shock with monetary policy. You don't have it today because there is no currency. The peso is a, is a, is a non-existing currency. But the problem, the second problem is implementation. Given that it, this is not a common currency that we are going to do in partnership with the U.S., we have to buy all the pesos running around the economy. And that, at today's rate, is an amount of dollars that the central bank doesn't have. There are a lot of discussions of Argentines are the biggest holders of dollars in the world after the United States, Argentine nationals. And so there are speculations how you could come and, and, and manufacture this transfer. But this is highly hypothetical, extremely complex chemistry. So as of today, uh, Millet is very conscious of this, and that's why now he talks of the transition pro time, a time to generate the necessary currency to buy out the running pesos and run into a dollar system. However, if you manage to stabilize the economy, uh, conventional economists would say, if you cut the budget deficit, if you manage to reduce inflation, if you do that, why going into dollarization? So the, the, the controversy on this is uh, very strong. I don't want to take all your time. We can come back to it. Right. But in any case, with or without dollarization, the, the historical experience with this type of inflation that we call high inflation regimes, Israel had this in the 80s, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, Mexico, is that the stabilization is extremely complex and either it's a shock or it's long, but that's a big challenge. De Debbie Gormazano, Debbie Gormazano, remind people of your dates when you were our correspondent there in, in Buenos Aires. Uh, I arrived in Buenos Aires in the aftermath of the 2001 crisis. Right. When the whole financial system Okay, so collapsed. you arrived in the aftermath of 2001. We're in 2023. Would you, back then, if you projected yourself 20 years in the future, would it seem normal to you that we're still talking about high inflation? I'm, I won't use hyperinflation, but <laughs> high, high inflation. Is this a normal state of affairs for Argentina? It, it, it seems that in inflation, or high, and sometimes hyperinflation, is the, has been the normal uh, economic way of Argentina for the past. You just, when you live there, you just live with it. It's no, there was a parenthesis of, of economic stability. You, you would three, you had a, a tres por uno, three pesos for one dollar. That was uh, introduced uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the 2001 uh, economic cr crash. And this lasted a good four or five years. So what happened? So, and that was, the, and I stayed four or five years in, in Argentina. And my friends told me, man, you've lived the most stable years of the Argentine economy in almost half a century, five, six years. And 2007, 2008, inflation came back at a smaller rate than now. And it has never stopped. It's been only accelerating and accelerating. And the other thing is that Mauricio Macri, between 2015 and, uh, and 2019, made a major mistake with a big loan from dealing a big loan with the IMF that is, impossible, that 
he, that all economists at the time knew would be impossible to repay. And the rest is history. So, we, had so, those, we had those vulture uh, funds uh, trying to get their money back and the so such. I don't understand either why inflation is something chronic, chronic in, in, in Argentina. I don't understand either how the right-wing government in 2016, 2017 took this huge IMF loan putting Argentina back into the debt crisis, which it took so many time and effort to, 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 to move out under the, the first mandate of Nestor Kirchner. All right, so for stabilizing... Uh... Let, me clarify, let me clarify something. It's, there, is a, there is a problem with the dates. Actually, the stability period started in 1991, and it was a one-to-one, one, not one-to-three, it was called the convertibility system where President Menem uh, fixed with, uh, with uh, Minister Cavallo after a hyperinflation in 1990, fixed the... the okay, the so, there, so, th so there have been, in effect, several periods where this has happened, is, is, is yeah, what you're saying. Yeah, but in 2001, there is a big difference. That was the major crisis in the post-war in Argentina, but was without... Inflation, because there was deflation in 2001 with the, the period between 91 and 2001. This is very different from today, because uh, inflation was not there in 2001. And, and inflation, after the shock of 2001 and the big debt crisis, inflation was a transitory problem. And in 2004, it was 4% a year again. Right, so, so, so we, 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 we can, we're seeing how, how uh, over the years there have been several scenarios. Uh, in any case, coming back to 2023, uh, Javier Millet's views on cost cutting and streamlining are, are well known. Take a look. Equipo y deporte, afuera. Ministerio de Cultura, afuera. Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible, afuera. Ministerio de las Mujeres y Género y Diversidad, afuera. Ministerio de Obras Públicas, afuera, aunque te resistas. Ministerio de Ciencia y Tecnología e Innovación, afuera. Ministerio de Trabajo, Empresa right, so, uh, That is uh, Ignacio Tesón, great television. Uh, it's very spectacular seeing uh, uh, Javier Millet do that. Do you really want him to get rid of all those ministries? Well, that's a personal question, and I would say yes. Um, I don't think that's strictly necessary, uh, but uh, I think it's it's for the best. It's for better because uh, you have many people working on the public system, which are basically doing nothing, not only on the national level but also on the subnational level, and Argentina has to recover some type of productivity. Um, workers should know that um, that the private that the private sector is the one that should be offering them opportunities, and not the state. Uh, one of the problems that I identify in in in, in young people is that uh, at least until yesterday, they thought that or. or Lots of lots of, of people like me, you know, young people, actually believe that the only way to to make a living is working on the public sector. Uh, young people trying uh, continuously to live to live thanks to the state, and, and I, I'm not I'm not talking about um, social problems. Okay, I'm talking about making a career in the public sector. Young people continuously and, and uh, ubiquitously, I mean, more than proportionally that, that you would expect in a society, wanted to make a career on the public sector. And that has to change. And one of the ways to change that is basically uh, not providing a place or not providing... Um, but yes, a place. Uh, You're saying it's got to be the private sector that, that does more. Uh, David Gormazano, your thoughts on this? I think it really hurts to hear that, that because 
Argentina over the years has produced great minds, uh, great professionals, uh, thanks to the state, because uh, it is the state that finances uh, science. It is, there is a, a heritage of a strong welfare system uh, with, with uh, a focus on, on education, quality education. In Argentina, you've had quality education, quality uh, health, uh, and, and, and science. All this has been more difficult over the years to, to finance this, but it's one of Argentina's great assets. It's, uh, it's the mines. And, uh, and uh, to hear that uh, the state is basically uh, to be dismantled because it's worthless, and that everything should, every, all, all, all the money, all the energy, all the creativity should be going to the, the private sector, I think is, is, um, is not right considering the, uh, the history of, of, of Argentina. Uh, Carlos Vinograd, is that again, just a campaign trail stunt or do you think it's real? Will there... Well, let, let's, uh, Francois, let's, let's try to be practical and realistic. Uh, as in any place in the world, there is a, a campaign and, 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 and responsibility and, and reality in government. So uh, I will, uh, Javier Millet, certainly he has a, an Austrian uh, philosophical background in his, in his talks and in his commitment. And, uh, but there is a reality. The taxation in the last 20 years in Argentina has doubled on the formal sector. The informal sector is uh, today almost 40% of the economy so the real taxation on the people that pay is absolutely unbearable. So there is a sustainability problem and incentive problem. There is a problem. The, the talk of, uh, of, uh, of dismantling the state is, is I think, uh, something that in terms of implementation is not a reality. The coalitions needed for governance in the coming uh, administration uh, are mixed and and this this will not happen uh, most probably because it's not implementable. All right, so so there's but, a there's a part but, of. But but one of the main reasons of chronic inflation in Argentina is out of control and persistent and chronic budget deficits that run and run and are the source of the debt the debt becomes non-payable and then you have a crisis. So let's separate the, the rhetoric and the reality. Argentina cannot bear today the, the, the cost of high taxation on few people. The society is fractured. Right. So there needs, there needs to be reform. The, the, the re I just want to get into some of the reactions from, uh, from abroad because the, the whole world has been watching this election. Uh, we have had in the last hour news, uh, if we look to the left among uh, 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 Argentina's neighbors, Brazil's president, who says he won't be uh, uh, taking part, going to, uh, to Buenos Aires for the inauguration ceremony. He, he tweeted courteously congratulating the winner. Uh, so did Chile's president. Uh, however, Colombia's Gustavo Petro uh, openly saying it's, a sa it's sad for Latin America and we shall uh, see neoliberalism no longer has any place in our society. It cannot respond to the current problems of humanity. And quote, uh, contrast that with uh, Brazil's former president, uh, Jair uh, Bolsonaro. He's saying congratulations to the Argentine people. Hope will shine again in South America. May these good wins reach the United States. They have an election coming up in 2024. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, uh, echoing uh, Bolsonaro, of course, uh, another nativist hoping for a comeback. Uh, Donald Trump himself, uh, he's saying congratulations to Javier Millet. Uh, the whole world was watching. I'm very proud of you. You will turn your country around and truly make Argentina great again. Of course, when Donald Trump was president, 
the U.S. dollar is the world's currency, and he could run that deficit, and, it, and run it did uh, 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 while he was president. Uh, Argentina doesn't have that, uh, that uh, luxury of, having, of holding the world's currency and being able to print banknotes uh, like that. Uh, David Gomenzano, your, your thoughts on, on the reactions you've seen from neighboring states? Uh, neighboring states, well, you had the, um, the Uruguay, the president of Uruguay reacted. Uh, he's a conservative and uh, he praised uh, Javier Milei and it was in had very bad terms with uh, acting president uh, Alberto Fernandez. And uh, more, that, that surprised me, but it, it was quite predictable, I think. Mo most of uh, Latin American governments are or left-wing at the moment, and uh, some were diplomatic, some a little less diplomatic. Is this a bellwether uh, with this election for the rest of Latin America, that there's going to be this pendulum swing? There are cycles, there are political cycles. So there, there was a time with Chavez, with Kirchner, with uh, Evo Morales, uh, where, where Latin America was uh, dominated by, by left-wing uh, governments. And then it swinged. There was there, these are cycles, and uh, maybe it's maybe Argentina is an exception because this uh, economic crisis that uh, been hitting the country is uh, is not it, it's not in other countries in Latin America, or maybe it's a signal that there is a new cycle starting. I'm thinking of Chile, if you know, if you remember the challenger Antonio Cast, who was. Uh, not so different from uh, uh, from Jair Bolsonaro or Javier Milei in, in its political options. That is, um, that will be probably running the next election and, and has a chance to win it. All right, we have another endorsement from a, a bit of a startling corner. Uh, Prosperity is ahead for Argentina, tweeted Elon Musk in replying to a post congratulating Milei from a, a far right wing account called End Wokeness. Uh, uh, Ignacio Tesson, let me ask you, when you see uh, those that are supportive of Donald Trump, uh, so enthusiastic, what we had uh, the uh, conservative talk show host, uh, Tucker Carlson, come to Buenos Aires, uh, is that just a bit of cheerleading uh, of like-minded fellows, or is there, are there real bonds between Javier Millet, Jair Bolsonaro, Donald Trump, or is it just, it's just kind of cheerleading? Well, those bonds are, are thinner than most people uh, would think. Uh, Millet uh, was was thought to be, or is still thought to be, uh, a crazy man for a lot of people. And well, he might be, but you get what you need. You don't get what you want. It's a famous Rolling Stones phrase, you know. Um, when I when 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 I see those those people supporting Malay, uh, first that's give, giving that's providing Malay basically credibility on a on the on, on the globe visibility. Uh, they are acknowledging acknowledging him, and they are well in the case of Trump and Bolsonaro, they are trying to get back to power. I wouldn't say that uh, being friends with Malay. Uh, Provides Bolsonaro or 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 or, or Trump uh, uh, edge over other other candidates. I guess it's more like a like a like a like a signal. Like you're like me, we can cooperate together in the future, maybe. And maybe specifically in the case of, of Bolsonaro, uh, the, I think. That Millet will help Bolsonaro just like um, Lula tried to help Massa get get elected. In fact, the, the the main campaign strategists for Massa were Brazilian uh, a Brazilian group, uh, which helped Lula uh, get back into power again. So, uh, what I would expect in the future, in in terms of um, geopolitics, uh, first. Millet has, has this uh, problem because the Democratic Party is on charge now of, of the United States. Uh, he, he, he has a problem because he wants to be reflected. He, he wants to be the United States. And paradoxically, the United States, the current administration, 
would most likely say that he he's not the guy that they want. So uh, they they have a problem. Mirai is more or less more or less like um, what what in the United States could be uh, Ron Paul or Rand Paul in in uh, in this case. Yeah, libertarian, uh, libertarian uh, senator Republican. from. The Libertarian Center from Kentucky. Carlos Vinograd, does this mean that uh, we're going to have a more polarized Argentina? This is a, a very interesting question, uh, Francois. The first thing is that I think that the cycles are, are, less, uh, are less hemispheric than depending on the incumbent. Uh, the, in Brazil, Lula came back after Bolsonaro, in uh, in Uruguay, there is a high probability that a center-left coalition will come back to power. The central issue in this back and forth, which is the normal uh, alternance in democratic systems, is that in Argentina, there is a profound economic and social disorder that uh, nothing will happen if the left-wing candidate wins in Uruguay. Probably the bonds will not move the next day. Uh, the same, more or less the same story happens in Brazil. Uh, despite the differences and the cultural fractures, uh, not, not, uh, not, not dramatic changes in expectations and in the economy. This is a big difference with Argentina. And that shows that a lot can be explained by the incompetence on, of the the hegemony of the populist Argentinian populist, and that that is a differential element uh, compared to take a country like Peru. It almost doesn't have a stable president. All the previous presidents are in prison for corruption, but the economy keeps running. We have a deeper uh, conflict. Kind kind so, of kind of the the, the opposite almost uh, the the. the um, uh, those culture issues uh, that, that uh, you mentioned, we, we don't have time to go into it, but uh, for instance, uh, the fact that Javier Millet is anti-abortion, uh, when he is sworn in, it'll be on December 10th, it'll come on the 40th anniversary of the inauguration of Raul Alfonsín, the first democratically elected uh, president of Argentina following the restoration of democracy. In a presidential debate, Javier Millet called into question the repression of the U.S.-backed coup of 1976 and the estimated 30,000 who disappeared at the junta's hands, he questioned uh, the, the, the numbers. Those culture wars, what are those going to be like, over the, especially over Argentina's past, David Gormizano? It's, <clears throat> is, is this just a little bit of provocation, or is Argentina headed for a whole re-prosecuting of uh, what happened under the generals? Uh, I think the big trauma for one half of Argentina is uh, about Javier Milei um, uh, putting, uh, saying that the dictatorship didn't kill that many people, uh, not 30,000, that it's, it's, a, it's a figure invented. Less than 8,000, he gave some precise number. It's a figure invented by the left, and uh, that there was no dictatorship, there was a conflict between uh, a far-left uh, far guerrilla and... Uh, and the army trying to protect uh, the state. So it, it's called uh, the theory of the two demons uh, that has been popular with uh, some sectors of, uh, of right-wing Argentina. Is this going to be big going forward? I think the people didn't vote for this. I think the 56% of, uh, of Argentines that voted for Millet do not agree with this. Uh, but it comes as a big challenge and it is very worrying, I think, because there was a consensus. It's, it's, he's the first politician to break this consensus over the, the years of the, 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 the military dictatorship. And you have to remember that Argentina is almost the only country in the world where uh, uh, generals that were responsible for a dictatorship were tried, were tried and actually went to jail. This didn't happen in Brazil. This didn't happen in Spain after the, the, the Franco era. It happened in Argentina. Uh, the, Argenti the Argentines have been very courageous in, in this path. And one of the, uh, one of the 
of the, of the achievements of the Kirchner administration. I hear all the, the critics against their, their, their management of the economy and, 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 and of other things. But one of their great achievements is to have uh, put an end to the period of amnesty and, 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 and forgetfulness. And to have put and, and to have permitted uh, trials of people who committed uh, very, crimes in, in, in the 70s and, and early 80s and, 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 and to push this, this process to, um, to, to quite a to, to great. Right, so definitely something uh, to be watching going forward. I want to thank you, David Gormazano. I want to thank uh, Ignacio Tezon and Carlos Vinograd for being with us from Buenos Aires. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.